Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I turned on the Zoom. It was still morning. I start recording. It's now afternoon. Uh, good afternoon. I uh, hope everybody's doing well. Uh, welcome back to the virtual Beit Midrash. Uh, hope everybody's had a good week and uh, looking forward to learning together today. Uh, welcome also to Parshat Vayakhel, our Torah reading for this week. Um, this is one of those years, just for fun facts for y'all, um, you know, this is one of those parshiot that often gets combined. There's a series of parshiot that usually you combine in normal years, but in leap years, when you have some additional weeks to do, this one, this get, the two parshiot get split up, so we actually get to just read Parshat Pekude this, or I'm sorry, Parshat Vayakel this week. Next week, we read Pekude rather than reading the two of them together. Um, so, um, God willing, everybody read Rabbi Sachs's commentary on it, um, on Vayakel, and so um, thoughts, comments, reactions before we jump in. Yes, Bart. I have a question on this on the second page, page one fourteen, and in the first full paragraph, Rabbi Sachs is talking about paying coaches to help build your self esteem, and he he appears to be saying that there's no religion involved in that. There's no more religion when you go into self-help books and I, I wanted to know does self-esteem have place in religion to me it seems that it does when you do the good things when you do tzedakah etc you get a good feeling about it which helps you to recognize or help you to feel a better self-esteem so I just questioned that particular point maybe i'm thank you yes margaret if you want to react first um my reaction would be that in some people that's true um but there are people um who i guess uh, the people who need some kind of help with self-esteem um are not able to to process things in that way, um, and they can do you know whatever good they want to, you know whatever good they happen to do, and their self esteem may um, may still be may still be low, um, you know people who have been diminished or whatnot by their um, uh, by their parents when they grow uh, as they're growing up and so on and so forth. So I don't think it's kind of an uh, I don't think it it always happens in the way that that you're that you're suggesting. I think that it happens maybe that way in a in a more um, say healthier, less neurotic person, something like that. Yes, Laura. I, I don't know how valuable my. This is terrible. I need some help, self-help book. But he starts the premises is that goes into a bookstore and he notices that the religious books are now outnumbered by the self-help books. Well, you know, bookstores put out books according to what sell. So I don't think it has anything to do with it. But, um, and I think self-help books are great. <laughs> I mean, I've, I've benefited a lot from them, but his, you know, point is not uh, totally missed on me that that community is part of a, a big part of the Jewish life. Um, I think without community, we would probably have perished long ago because it seems like all we have is ourselves. But we have but, each other. We have each other. <laughs> Well, that's what I'm, you know. Right. I mean, I think that's what yeah. he's saying. But so, I, I, I kind of took offense at, at putting down the self-help sections because I think it 
really does help a lot of people get through a lot of things that you you need professional help with. The end. Going back to mute so that I don't. <laughs> so here was kind of my thought. And uh, Laura, your shirt, your T-shirt, I think maybe subconsciously brought it to mind. Is uh, the karate grand. <laughs> um, I was thinking the karate kid, right? So everybody seen the movie? I hope. No. Nominal movie, 80s classic, Ralph Macchio at his best, in my opinion. Um, good in Cobra Kai too, in the sequel, but yeah, I, I digress. Um, <clears throat> you know, there's a great scene where, you know, uh, Mr. Miyagi takes him out onto a boat and has him stand on the boat on one leg. And it's like, karate is all about balance. He's like, not just, and he says, not just in karate, but in life. It's all about balance. Um, so, Barbara, to your point, yes, there is self-esteem that, self-esteem is a part of the religion and a part of Judaism. And there's a balance that needs to be involved. Um, you know, I, I I love. There's a great great legend about uh, Reb Simcha Simcha Bunim of Peshischar that he would carry two notes in his two notes, one in each pocket. <laughs> on one, it said, "For me, the world was created," and on the other, it said, "I am but dust and ashes." And that's the balance that we're supposed to strike in Jewish thought, that there's a humility of knowing we are just humans and we are just here for a certain limited amount of time and to do the best we can. And we're not perfect. We're not superior. We're just dust and ashes. And that we are wonderful and we are great and God loves us and this world was created for our benefit. And so in this sense, we're supposed to walk that that balance between the two poles. Um, it is possible to have too much humility. Uh, possible to have too much self-esteem too. Other comments, thoughts? <clears throat> well, I don't know if humility is the word. Um, I was just thinking about what other people were saying. And I think you need a certain amount of ego strength, of self-confidence to go out into the world and to focus on other people. If you're not, if you don't have a certain amount of confidence, you're worried about what they're thinking about you and you don't see them and their problems. So it's not balanced at the same time. It's kind of one follows the other. First, you need that basic ego strength and self-confidence, and then you go out into the world. And yeah, I'm, yeah, I, I agree with that. I think that um, and there's balance to be set from, from the way I look at things, and just from what I've been able to get. You need a, a balance between ego and empathy or a combination actually not a balance but a combination of those two things which is pretty much what Suzanne just said but I think that's that's very important if you're gonna you know good you have, you've got to have enough ego strength to take those steps there. yeah I actually thought Suzanne you were gonna go in a different direction with that you know there because yes there is a level of um self-confidence to say you know I am in a good position in my life or I'm in a position in my life and there are others who are less fortunate and I can, and I have the ability to be able to help them out. I thought you were going to go in the flip of looking at yourself and being like, there's so many problems in the world, I can't do anything about it. Or who am I that, you know, who am I to see this problem and actually make a difference? And that's actually 
where an imbalance where too much humility comes into place is if you look at the world and say i can't make a difference i'm just me i'm just little old me i can't do anything about it i guess it depends if you're an optimist or a pessimist <laughs> Well, it also depends whether you were listening to Rabbi a few weeks ago when he when he said very strongly that you have to um the the point that you know you are not a, you don't have to fix everything, but you are obliged to to do something to make an effort to contribute. So I would just like to say, um the congregant just quoted me from a few weeks ago, which means my work here is done. Class is over. I'm, <laughs> I know somebody remembered what I taught. Uh, so, um, <laughs> that helped your ego. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, but I, I hear where everybody's coming from, but, you know, I want to come back to what Rabbi Sachs is trying. What's Rabbi Sachs's point? with all this though. I, I, I was just going to say that I thought it was kind of a jump to go from Moses having the people work together on the, I forgot what they built. A the Mishkan. Tabernacle. Yeah. yeah. Um, tabernacle the, if you prefer, but. Yeah. Um, that that's a jump to, you know, to what we're talking about, it could just as well be that he just wanted to refocus them on God, and that was the whole point. So you know, he he does bring up an interesting point. Yeah, I thought so. Make any sense with with the building of the Mishkan is. Yes, he does want to refocus them. He does want to recenter them after the golden calf. But, you know, within six verses after the splitting of the Sea of Reeds, what happens? Kvetching. They start kvetching. We don't have any water. Get us some water. Next <laughs> chapter, we don't have any food. Get us some food. They start complaining. They start whining. Um about half of the book of numbers is spent with them whining and complaining. <laughs> Even last week, Moses has disappeared. Aaron, do something to save us, to help us. But they're not complaining. The last two partio, there's no complaining whatsoever. They're working together as a united community in a common effort, in a common goal, with no kvetching. And it's not easy, you know. I I can barely build an Ikea, a piece of Ikea furniture without kvetching. <laughs> they're building like a sanctuary, a tabernacle, like a big structure, and they're not complaining. Um, what is it they say about a constructively busy child? <laughs> So exactly, you know, when there's something, and I think that's a little bit of where he's trying to go, is that, you know, we become sometimes so obsessively looking inwards, but sometimes we can resolve some of that inner turmoil by looking outwards and doing something for other people and with other people in particular. Um, and I think that's where his criticism of all the self-help comes, self-help books comes from is like, it's, it's all inner work. It's all look at yourself, look at yourself, look at yourself. And I, I, I do like the thing of, he's talking with self-itis of, you know, the people who I take selfies it. of themselves all the time. Yeah. Like it's one thing to take a selfie periodically to commemorate an occasion, but like, people who stand in the mirror to take selfies like all the time and look at what I'm wearing and let me like, so, um, I mean, heck there's that, that's an entire enterprise. Now people make their living on taking pictures of themselves and videos of themselves and showing it to the world. Um, 
And I think what he's trying to argue is fine, but that's not what religion teaches. And we've kind of lost that sense of community and relationship that is so vital to our spiritual and emotional health. But that's really what we need to get back to and to focus on is, you know, you're anxious, you're depressed. There's a lot of things to be anxious and depressed about in this world. I hear that. Um, And yes, there is some inner work. There is some inner work that you can do to help it. But maybe the best, best antidote isn't the inner work it's the outer work of working with other people towards a common goal that you are passionate about and that you feel productive tk you had something i just i keep hearing in my head i was trying not to say it but there's an old architect saying don't work with or for a married couple there are more diverse divorces while building houses <laughs> at any other time. Lots of so the, the, the idea of this complicated structure being constructed properly and calmly is um, but this this is three or four pages. It's brief. You can't the, the main point is being made. Yes, TK. Um, in in uh, keeping with the movie, uh, I don't know if anybody remembers the movie The Razor's Edge with Bill Murray. Um, yes, no. Now I'm upset that I missed the Bill Murray movie, but you um... missed a, the best Bill Bill Murray movie, in my opinion. Uh, this is a movie about a young man in, I think it's either World War One. I, I think it might be, maybe two, but I think it's World War One, and he is an ambulance worker in the war. And he, uh, he comes home very disturbed and depressed. And he ends up going to uh, India, to Nepal, Nepal, and finding monks and trying to find himself and I hate, I hate to give away the whole movie because it's really a great movie, but it's two years. Spoiler years. alert. I spoiler <laughs> alert, but it's no, two if, years. if you don't want to hear it, just close your ears. Uh, close your ears or, or turn your sound off. So so he he is like on this search for the meaning of life, basically, and what you know, what is it all about? Because he's seen so much death and destruction. And he the monks eventually send him up on the mountaintop by himself. With a, with a, and he takes all his books. He's supposed to find enlightenment on this mountaintop. And it's obviously very cold up there. And he's got a tiny little fire and he's trying to read and his hands are frozen and he can't read. And finally in disgust, he just starts tearing out, tears out a page out of the book and feeds it to the fire. And, and then he starts doing it with the, all of the books feeding it to the fire and goes and he has enlightenment he gains satori understanding that all of these words are meaningless and and so he comes down off the mountain literally and goes back into the world and he goes into at that time there were um uh what do you call it heroin dens i guess i don't know what city he was in but he goes into this opium he, dens. Call opium, them. okay, opium dens. Thank you. And he goes and he he finds this woman who has lost her husband and just went. That's her, she's just went completely downhill. Anyway, he he spent he he goes outside of himself, like you were saying, to help this woman because he's realized that's what. That's what it's all about. It's not about him. It's about what he can do. Or he he has gained the understanding that meaning is to be found not in someone else's words 
or study or even introspection. It's to be found in what you can do in the world for others, which I think is Rabbi Sachs's point, maybe. That's part of it, yeah. I mean, I use I use a, I don't use that particular movie, but I say that to um, I say that to particularly B'nai Mitzvah kids frequently. Is that you know Judaism is not a religion in which you find enlightenment on alone on the top of a mountain. There are religions that do that, as you just illustrated. Um, Judaism finds enlightenment in relationship and partnership with other people. But that's and, what he learned. Yes, exactly. I, I, I came I'm, down. I'm reinforcing. Okay. <laughs> like, uh, you know, you you learn Torah with partners. You you study together because you realize you can't gain full understanding on your own. You need that dialogue and relationship to bring out God's God's meaning. Um you can't say the full service without a minion of 10 adults. You, you can't build a Mishkan by yourself. You need a community to do that. Um, that's, that's, you know, that movie very affirms a lot of what Judaism tries to teach, that enlightenment is found, and in, as Sachs would say, happiness is found, not in that self-reflection, but in working, helping other people, doing things outside of yourself, um, in order to, in order to improve yourself and be the best person you can be, you need that relationship. Dan, did you have something before? Or, uh, yes. Uh, one thing. Uh, I think he was successful in his idea because here was a group of people who were moaning and complaining. And then they gave, once they got involved, they gave more than they than mm -hmm. he could use. They had to tell him, stop your donations, they're too much. The only time in nonprofit history that they said, <laughs> please stop donating. <laughs> we yeah. have more than we could ever use. What are you talking about? <laughs> when they were building, the when they were asking for stuff to build the Mishkan. And I have yeah, a, yeah. Quite a question uh, about what Rabbi Sachs's life lesson. He says, happiness, so-and-so. Is happiness our goal? Should happiness be our goal? It depends how you define happiness, I think. But um... it's collective happiness, I should think so. You know, how do you define happiness? I think might answer that question. If you're like, oh, I feel happy all the time. Well, no, that's never going to happen. If you think of it as like a self-contentment, that might be part of the goal, yes. And he's trying to say, you know, you, you're not going to find that by only by like looking inside at yourself. You're going to find it by, he's beyond the self and the strength of our relationships, our connections to community and what we give and are given. Um, self-contentment if you if you mean happiness as self-contentment yes if you mean like i feel joyous well no i i agree that's not that's a it's it's great to experience joy as long as, and you need to experience joy but it's momentary but you're never going to you're never going to spend every moment of your life joyous yes mark um first of all uh... TK, did you really mean to um, uh, the enlightenment as a pun? <laughs> um, second of all, the thing I liked about this um, chapter, um, as someone who is, um, I guess, um, doubtful uh, at the very least about uh, God. Um, 
I really liked the the um, emphasis on um, on community as as an important um, as an important part of the religion. It kind of made me, uh, you know. I mean, just speaking kind of personally, um, you know, it it kind of made me feel um, more legitimate than when people talk about. Um, God a lot and and I feel like um you know I'm either not in the conversation or I'm you know um well I'll just leave it at that. I'm right the there with you, Margaret. In the old days, we used to say a lot, it takes a village. And in, I think in that time, we were talking about raising children. It takes a village to raise your children and to be good people, et cetera. But as I was going through this, I was thinking that he's clearly, Dr. Rabbi Sachs is clearly telling us that a good life takes a village. That you can't get to a lot of these peak experiences even, or even the the momentary happiness of it without the rest of the village. And as I look at Suzanne and Howard, I would consider our whole row in Temple and their children and grandchildren were in that row. As members of our direct village, we knew that any one of those parents could tell our kids, do this, do that. You gave the trope wrong in this. I mean, people came up and corrected my son all the time. <laughs> uh, happy that he was doing it, but still saying, no, you need to do it this way. And it wasn't always, hey, you're, you know, you're misbehaving. It was real cooperative. And it was very nice to have all those people in the Temple Bethel village supporting their development. And um, it takes a village if Temple Bethel is that part of our village, it gives us the opportunity to cooperate in helping other people to have good points in their life. And no, Margaret, I didn't say anything about God. I was only talking about community in that. <laughs> yes, you know, we, we do usually refer to it in terms of raising children, and it's absolutely true in raising children, too. But I think Rabbi Sack's point is yes, and raise having a good life, like living a good life means it takes a village to be, to have a good life too. You can't you can't live life alone on your own. You, you need to have friends and community and people that you are working together with on a common goal to have that to have that good life. I think I would like to think that there's great variety among the people, the people who are working towards happiness. Some can enjoy large social gatherings of whatever kind every day of the week. Others are much quieter. And some people are find their community almost exclusively in their own family. But there's a lot of closeness and a lot of warmth and love in that way of living. Yes, and, I, there, you know, it doesn't say who your community has to be. It just has to be pe other people that you are giving back to and working with right. in a common goal to with. Um, what I'll say is, you know, even even the most introverted introverts still need some socialization at some point you know they they can't they're you know you look at research on uh, uh those convicts who have been in um solitary. solitary confinement for extended periods of time their mental health declined pretty drastically at, at some point i don't know the exact time frames uh, i think i've read it but i don't remember but there's kind of universal acceptance that at some point that in solitary confinement, it has a severe effect on their mental health because you need socialization in some way, shape or form. Um, 
so yes, uh, introverts introverts still need socialization. It might be in a smaller group. It might be in a different context, mm -hmm. but they still need it. <laughs> I'm, I'm in a I'm in the process of reading a book about um, the depression and and hard scrabble life in Iowa. It is it is the worst. I mean, Marilyn Robinson. I don't know if y'all know her. I mean, she's a famous writer, novelist. What a Pulitzer. Anyway, she. The, but the one thing that this little girl grows up with absolutely nothing. I mean, nothing. And and the the worst thing that she has is when she's she's by herself, when she has nobody. She's in a, but she's warm, which is a lot of times she's not. She's got some food, but she, she's the most depressed. She's the saddest. She's you know. So it's just to reinforce what you said. And babies that are raised in dresser drawers, and you know, we know. I mean, Howard, you know this all this much better than I do. The babies that are that are not given, you know, social stimuli, um, you you know, they can they can be tube fed or whatever, uh, you know, as much as you want to, and they fail you to thrive. They they don't uh, they don't survive. Right. Yeah, that came along with me in my training, actually, in Cleveland, the guy that started all this being with the, the mother, breastfeed, how the importance of breastfeeding, all this stuff kind of got started. Otherwise, people put these little babies off, you know, they didn't have any contact except the nurse coming by every once in a while. Our yeah. first... Uh... Our first child, there were very some severe problems when she was first born. It does they never lasted, but they had us go into the nursery and you know and put our hands through. I mean, she was in a, an isolation thing and had you know put our hands and 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 stroke her, and that was kind of that was in that was kind of new at the time, um, but yeah. Is well, I'll say, you know, it's it's interesting because if you talk to teachers of kindergarten, pre-K teachers right now, uh, even first grade right now, um, you know, it's interesting to talk to, especially if they've taught for a long time, because this is those are the COVID kids. Mm -hmm. Those are the ones who were toddlers, babies, or newborns during COVID. Um, socially, they're struggling a little bit, yeah, because they didn't they they didn't have they were they were in their bubble with get social their family, um, and you know they weren't quite as isolated as you guys are talking about. You know, they still had family around usually, but you know it's. Teachers who have taught for a while will say, like, these are very different classes and they're working on very different skill sets that they're not used to doing at that age level because the kids have never developed it because of COVID. Um, but you see it in, you know, it's interesting because you see it in kids, you see it in teenagers right now because so much of what they're doing is online, social media, that they're not getting together outside of school the way that, you know, even I did. Um, and you see it with the elderly who don't have the ability to connect in the same way or might not be able to travel or drive, that there's there's a profound loneliness um, amongst a lot. And you see it in middle aged people, too, who, you know, their kids are now growing up and they don't have they don't know have any friends now because they put so much energy into their kids. They don't have friends. Um you know, there's a profound loneliness in this world that we we sometimes just kind of skip over because it's like that's part of life. But I think that's a I don't know I don't know if that's directly what he's trying to push back on, what Rabbi Sachs is pushing back on, but there's there's a level of we can't we have to as he says, like he quotes the Talmud, a prisoner cannot free himself from prison. Um, takes a very different feel of that story after October 7th, but you know, that's a different discussion. Um, but it's true for us too. Like we, 
we need other people to help us free ourselves from whatever is holding us back, from whatever we're struggling with. We can't do it by ourselves. We need other people to help us get through it. Yes, Barbara. Rabbi Sachs goes through a number of the things that show that Judaism requires a community or that Jewish people need to be part of a community. And maybe because he's not the one that cooks for his family, he left out one of my favorite ones, which I think is somewhere you're told to do that. And that's have people over for, fry, for a Shabbos dinner. And that's one of my favorite things to do. I'm looking at people here, a few of whom have been to my house for dinner. And if you haven't, please let me know and come over. I mean, like this Friday is available. <laughs> but, well, we, have a, we have a dinner at the synagogue. Oh, the, I know, but I wasn't invited because I signed up too late. So <laughs> I will serve you fried chicken, but it ain't going to be Warren's fried chicken. It'll still be delicious. <laughs> I had earlier. <laughs> so, yeah, come for dinner Fridays. No, come Agreed. For, but that socialization is much easier for me to do than to think about, oh, I got to get together 10 men for a minion. I got to, you know, so that I can say these prayers. And I'm being sarcastic when I say 10 men, since this is a conservative group. But it, it honestly, there are so many things that maybe we don't even think about that we do naturally that come from being a community. And it doesn't have to be your family that can come over. It's your community that joins you. So his list, I'm sorry, he just doesn't cook dinner to know. Uh, no, I was, it was funny. I was, I was listening to you talk about it. I, I agree with you 100%. Fine. But, um, you know, the Talmud will sometimes look at a Mishnah and say, you know, the Gemara will look at the Mishnah and be like, you know, why did it give this example and not this example or this example or this example? And sometimes it'll just come back and say, he didn't list every, the, the, the rabbi didn't list every possible example. <laughs> like, yeah, yes, he gave some examples. It's not an exhaustive list, but that's a great one also of, um, you know, um, why am I blanking on the thing? Um, orchim, like uh, welcoming guests and welcoming people into you. That's a great way to build community and a great way to, you know, a, a great antidote to the self itis that he talks about. I want to talk about something else, not a recipe. And that's... The words of Monty Python, and now for something completely different. <laughs> Well, it is, a, it is completely different, and it's in something else that I read some time ago from Rabbi Sachs, where he was talking about art. And as I look around the pictures today, or the little screen things, there's art showing in a lot of people's pictures. Or I can imagine that's a one, two, three, you know, there's art showing. And he talks about the beauty of the priestly garb, for example, we didn't stress that a, a lot. The um, the art in in the Mishkan itself, the the doves, etc., or whatever those birds are. But it it becomes really important in terms of our appreciation of it, um, and it, it it beautifies the com. The command that beautifies our community, the art hanging around at, at Bethel, um, the beauty in different people's toilets. So the appreciation for that, I think, brings us together. And when I look at various pieces of art, I like to get into looking at it and kind of let my mind wander and see what's going on there that shows me something about um, this beautiful art is showing me what about Judaism. And so you go back to what's the most beautiful thing you can see? A person, another person, your your child, your relative, your the person across the community or across the sanctuary. Why are they beautiful? Why are you beautiful, Rabbi? 
because you're made in the image of God. And that's going way back to the first chapter. So I think a lot of the things that we've talked about have gone to being made in the image of God. A lot of the lessons that Rabbi Sachs tries to make. Rabbi Sachs is, has used that a lot to, to talk about the beauty of what God has created. And I just wanted to say it struck me looking at our pictures this morning, how much art there is. And I guess I could turn my camera the other way so you don't see my piece of art. Well, now you can see even more. <laughs> and, um, it, uh, sometimes you look at those and you say, a beautiful beach, the one directly behind my head. It's a beautiful beach. And God made the beach, but he also made it possible for someone to paint that. And the people in there are also made in the image of God. But I know that's not what he was talking about here, but it struck me as a good point from this Parsha for, for another another class. Yes, I, <laughs> I appreciate what you're saying, Barbara, and, and uh, I, my uh, son-in-law came over this past weekend and uh, hung a whole bunch of pictures that has been hanging around my house that I didn't know what to do with. So I have lots more art in my house now than than I did. But, it, you know, it that rang a bell with me. I wanted to, and I don't know if it's really not exactly related to, uh, it's more the Parsha than it is the, the um, Saxe's commentary. But um, in reading the Parsha, I was, struck by um by the sphinxes um talks a lot i mean repeatedly in 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 uh, in the decorations that are described in the in the in in, in the parsha it talks about sphinxes which i think of as egyptian um and um i, I don't it, would you mind going down a rabbit hole for thirty seconds and and enlightening me about? Uh, uh, I I would need I I don't recall sphinxes, so I would need a verse that refers to it, and I can I can check. My guess it's translation, and you know somebody might be translating it as sphinx, and somebody else might be translating it as something else. But okay, sphinxes. Where is Mishka? Oh. Uh, yeah. Uh, my, uh, 